John chapter 15, verse 1. We started last week talking about being fruitful and how that God wants us to be fruitful. And I spent so much time on the vision that we didn't get very far into it. So I told you last week that today we're going to go through five things about fruitfulness. How many of you would believe this, that God wants you to be fruitful? Okay. So I, I think, honestly, probably most Christians would at least uh, quickly say, yeah, I believe that. But, but then once you dig deeper, I think honestly, many Christians might have the idea that because they're not experiencing fruitfulness at a particular season of their life, the enemy kind of sits on our shoulder and says, well, you know, God's blessing them, but boy, you're not. Maybe this is just your cross to bear. And if we're not careful, we can get into an idea that we would never, we would never agree to. God doesn't want you to be fruitful. But I, but I think that to embrace God wants me to be fruitful and I'm going to contend for that. I think it's, it's sometimes more difficult than people really, maybe really want to even admit. Because I think the enemy's pretty good at convincing us that maybe... You know, this is my cross to bear. This is my thorn in the flesh. It might, you know, might be whatever. But God wants us to be fruitful. And so we're going to end this message today. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate. Come with your shouting clothes. What color do we celebrate for Pentecost Sunday? Red's been the color of the church for years for Pentecost. How many of you are thankful for the Holy Spirit of God being poured out on the face of the earth? Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I'm, I, I actually told Durrett yesterday. In the, in the morning, we were kind of just sitting around our table having a little bit of breakfast. I said, honey, tomorrow is Pentecost Sunday. She kind of looked at me and it's like, why aren't you as excited as I am? She goes, you might want to look at your calendar. And I went, in two weeks, it's Pentecost Sunday. So June 5th, Pentecost Sunday, come we're going to talk about the third person of the Trinity, and I'm telling you, I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. But let's, let's get here. If you have a red letter edition of your Bible, or if your maybe Bible program <clears throat> has it, this, you know, John chapter 14, 15, and 16 are pretty much all in red. Jesus gives a lot of instruction, but let's just pick up here, John 15, 1. I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. If, if I could put it in gardener's terms that he's the master gardener, right? So maybe that's a designation that some of you have of, you know, you can get that designation of being a master gardener, but him. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The problem, so verse two is a great verse and anybody that understands gardening well gets verse two really well, because there's things that, that need to be pruned in our lives. The problem is, is the enemy convinces some people that they're in a, in a perpetual taking away. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And they get this idea of God that he just likes to cut away at you. A master gardener understands that the end, at the end of every branch, so at the end of a apricot twig, at the end of a in any, any twig, at the end of it, there's a set of cells that cover the end. If my finger was the end, the end of these cells would be different than these cells. And it's a set of cells that are called growth cells. And they tell the plant genetically, they tell the plant genetically to be productive. Problem is, is it can come to a place, if you get one of these that's a sucker, it will have, it'll take a lot of energy from the rest of the plant, but it just, it's useless. It looks good. In fact, there's a lot of Christians that are suckers. Right? They look good. Truth is, is they're never going to be fruitful because they're not, they're, a sucker's not designed to produce fruit. A sucker just drains and looks good. But I've come across people like that. Have you? They look good. The truth is, is they're never going to be productive. And a master gardener will come in and cut that. And, and what that does, it's a, it's a specific term. It's called apical dominance. And when you cut that off, you break what's called the apical dominance. And you'll cause that plant. It'll tell the plant to go, oh, we need to be productive. Then it'll start to grow. So, so like when you trim a tree, big tree branch, you cut it off. 
What happens the next year? Right there, right there it starts to grow. The reason why is because the apical dominance of that, that limb has been broken now. And so that's what a master gardener does. How many of you know that there's some things in our life that, that if they're not taking away, will drain your energy? And it will not, you won't, be, you won't be as fruitful as you can be. But anyhow, here's what's cool. So those that don't bear fruit, he takes them away sucker branches. And then every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it, not so that he can slow your success, not so that he can keep you humble. He prunes you, those places that are bearing fruit, he prunes so that it can do what? Look at it. It says that it may bear more fruit. Turn to your neighbor and say more fruit. So here's the thing. However fruitful you are, I guarantee you the master gardener sees in you more fruit. And if we'll let him we can be even more fruitful. Amen? Okay, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken, so abide in me. How many of you know it doesn't say take a vacation to me? Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. We sang the last song that we sang, Christ is enough. How many of you know it starts with Jesus, it continues with Jesus, and it ends with Jesus? Without him, we can do nothing. And so that's just something for us to realize that, you know what? I can't be fruitful by myself. I can't make that happen. I've got to be connected to the vine, and then I've got to submit to the master gardener. I've got to submit to the lordship of Christ in my life. Um, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. How many of you know it's good to always keep that in mind? He's the master, we're the servant. He's the Lord, we're not. He's God, I'm not. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're buried or burned, excuse me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, how many of you know we cannot treat God like a lawyer? Any lawyers in the house, it's not offensive, I'm just saying. Most of the time we contact a lawyer when what? Something's gone wrong, right? How many of you know God is not our lawyer? He's our father, right? Um, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it'll be done for you. Now, lest you have the idea, good, I can get anything I want. No, you can get anything he wants. Amen? But I'll say this. He wants far more for you than you want. Amen? He wants to bless in ways that we never dreamed of yet. By this, I love this last verse, by this is my Father's glorified, that you bear much fruit. How many of you know not just eke out a bit? that you bear much fruit. So to bear much fruit, we have to understand to bear much fruit, those branches that are bearing fruit, he prunes so that it can bear more fruit. So how many of you know that it's a continual process of just saying, God, I submit to you, do in me, through me, to me, whatever needs to be done. And we can know this. It'll only be for our good because it will bear fruit for him. God gets glory out of Christians who are fruitful. So, so that's important. I, I think sometimes the enemy just is, is way too successful in, in convincing us that maybe God doesn't want, well, God wants them to be fruitful, but me, no. I think the enemy sometimes is too successful in getting us convinced of those things. Genesis chapter one, verse 28, in the message translation, I just like how Peterson wrote it. He said, God bless them, so to Adam and Eve. So this is the start of human creation. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. I put that in there to just get us down on the, get it down on the inside of us. From the get-go, God pronounced fruitfulness on human beings. Amen? So we looked at last week just a little bit. I just mentioned, I think, um, last week that if, you know, in the agricultural world with livestock, the first thing that gets shut off in livestock is the reproductive, if they're not healthy. When an animal gets um, unhealthy, 
the first thing that goes is they don't reproduce. And I think there's a lot of Christians that aren't being productive and, and it, you can tie it back to the fact that they're not healthy. I'm, 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 and I'm talking <clears throat> not just physically, I'm not talking about physical health necessarily, but I'm talking about spiritual health. Their spiritual health is in such a, such a state that, that they're not being fruitful. They're not being reproductive. And so that's something that obviously we just take before the Lord. But let's get into the five things <clears throat> that if you're taking notes, just maybe write out five points and I'll give you a, a kind of a succinct deal and then we'll chat about it. The first thing in being fruitful is to realize that we have to be determined. Everybody say determined. We have to have determination to keep trying to be fruitful in life. It's a, it's a biblical concept that we would call faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. In other words, if, if, if I'm going to be fruitful in whatever area it is of life that I'm looking at to be fruitful, for, say for instance, my marriage, for me to have a fruitful marriage, um, you know, and here we are, my Durant and I've been married a while. Wow. 40 years. That's a long time. We have a fruitful marriage. I want a fruitful marriage. And I'm determined to have a fruitful marriage. But if I think that I can stop trying and still have a fruitful marriage, I'm just a dreamer. Are you with me? Oh, yeah, after 40 years, you get a few things figured out. But you know what? I've never lived with a 60-year-old woman before in my whole life. So I'm going to have to get that figured out. She's never lived with a 62-year-old guy in her life. She's going to have to get that figured out. I've never lived with an empty nester mom who still is concerned about every kid. Do you think it's like, babe, they're an adult. They have children. They can figure it out. We've never been empty nesters before. Life's different for us. Are, are you with me? And if I think that I can be fruitful in my marriage and not have to do anything, then you know what? I'm just, I'm just not the brightest light on the tree. Determination has to be a part of the ingredient. I have to be determined to be faithful. Faithful to do what? To just foot, put one step in front of the other. Any of you watch the movie, What About Bob? Right? Baby steps. Sometimes in life, our strides are different lengths, right? Sometimes life can be that we can take kind of a decent stride. If I walk normal, like here, I can tell you, my stride's about 35 and a half inches. I've measured it multiple times. That's how I measure out fence posts and all of that. I just do my normal stride. But if I'm on an incline, I can just tell you, I can't take that big of a stride. Right? I have to take smaller strides, baby steps, whatever it may be. Kicker is, I just have to, the first thing for me to be fruitful that I have to realize is I have to be determined. I just have to just, just, Suck it up, buttercup. I've, I've got to get determined to say, you know what? I'm going to stay hooked. I'm going to be faithful. The second thing, go to the book of Matthew chapter 25. The second thing that I find, this is one of the things that just in my years of experience, being immersed in the body of Christ um, and, and just being around hundreds and maybe even at this stage, thousands of people that that probably is one of the biggest areas that most Christians neglect is this point. You need to increase your skill level. You need to increase your skill level. It's not up to God. You need to increase your skill level in those areas that God's gifted you in. You need to do it. Turn to your neighbor and point at him and say, you need to do it. In other words, here's the idea that many Christians have. It's, it's not on purpose. And it's not based upon a, it's not based upon an agenda. It's not based upon a bad attitude. But at the same time, we have this idea that if God has gifted me in something, then it's just going to, it's just going to grow. When I think God sometimes would look and go, yes, I gave you the gift, but now what are you doing to increase the gift? What are you doing to increase the gift? For instance, music is an area that I'm familiar with. When I was 12, I went to my mom. By the way, my sister's here. Dana, raise your hand. This is my older sister. 
I have two older sisters. This is the second to the oldest. And uh, she's eight years older than I am. And she and her husband, Sid, are visiting us from Texas. Uh, my mama, our mama, turns 90 years old in uh, a couple weeks. And this was a time we could get together. So we're going to celebrate mom's birthday day. But anyhow, when I was 12, I went to my mom. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, would you buy me a piano? I wasn't a piano player. I didn't have a piano. I said, would you buy me a piano? And I'm so thankful that my mom never poo-pooed that. Because my, she says, why do you want a piano? And I said, because uh, I believe God wants me to play the piano and sing. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, Andre Crouch, I heard Andre Crouch's story. Uh, when he was 10, his daddy was a pastor of a church. And um, their piano player didn't show up to church on a Wednesday night. And Andre's dad looked at Andre as a 10-year-old and said, son, I want you to come to the piano. I'm going to lay my hands on you, and you're going to play. So his dad laid his hand on him, and Andre played. And, of course, you know, Andre Crouch now, they credit. And all of music, Andre Crouch has touched more musicians than any other musician that they know about. Because it's, it's incredible. Anyhow, I heard that story as a 12-year-old kid. And in the innocence of my heart, I don't think God's answered the prayer yet, but in the innocence of my heart, I prayed for a double anointing. I said, Lord, I want a double anointing of Andre Crouch. I'm pretty convinced that he, <laughs> that that hasn't happened yet, but <laughs> that was the impetus for me. And, and I'm so thankful that my mom, and, and just parents, this is a side note, sometimes your kids will come up something some come up with something that's really God and you be careful that you don't respond just out of your flesh, right? Because my mom very easily could have said, well, you don't play the piano. My mom could have come up with a hundred different things. We can't afford one, whatever. But I'm so thankful that my mom was sensitive. Now, I don't know if she would tell the story the same way I'm telling it, but I just know that her, re I was on the receiving end. Mom went, okay. And in two weeks, she found a piano for $75 and um, got the piano into the house. And I practiced a song that Andre Crouch wrote called The Blood Will Never Lose His Power. And I went to the keyboard, never had played and didn't take any lessons. And I went to the keyboard and just hen picked out the melody. And then around that, I thought, okay, there's gotta be a chord that surrounds this. And for three months, I sat at that piano and worked my tail off. And then I called my pastor, Brother Bierman. I said, I'm ready to sing. Because I told Brother Bierman that I asked mom, I told Brother Bierman this story that I prayed for a double anointing and I asked my mom to buy me a piano. And he said, okay. He said, when you're ready to sing, you let me know. So I called him three months later and I said, I'm ready to sing. So on a Sunday morning in Burlington, Colorado in 1972, I sat down at the piano and sang The Blood and Lever Loses Power, playing the piano. Since that time, I've given myself where the season has allowed. My point is, what if I would have just said, well, God's gifted me in music. I don't need to practice. I don't need to practice playing. I don't need to practice singing. I can sing. He's gifted it to me, so the Lord's just going to open the doors. And so many Christians, I think, do that. They think because it's supernatural... What I mean by supernatural, that God gave it, they think everything else is just going to be supernatural. And I think God's just looking at us sometimes and go, okay, so what are you willing to do now? And so this parable in chapter 25 of Matthew, I'll just tell it to you. I'll give you the address so you can read along while I'm telling it to make sure that I'm telling it right. There's three people that this story entails. Jesus is telling us a parable. He said that a, that a master gave three of his servants, some talents. He, to one he gave five, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. He then went away to a faraway land, so we get the picture, right? You know, God's the master, we're the servants, and he's given his servants gifts. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're talented. So to be sure, ta talent, talent as it's used in this story is money. Okay, but we all get that the idea that it's applicable to other things, to gifts that God has given us. So he said he went away to a far country and then he returned. 
And when he returned, he went to each of them and said, what have you done with what I've given you? To the one that gave five talents, he said, well, sir, I went out and I, I invested that five and I used, this is the subtext, and I used what you gave me and boy, I did my studies and I did whatever I needed to do. And here, I've got five more. You gave me five, I'm giving you 10 back. The one that had two, the same story. He said, man, I, you gave me two and I just want you to know I worked my tail off and, and I, I produced two more. So four, here's yours. And then the one that had one talent, he said, you know what? You kind of are intimidating and that gift that you gave me, I didn't do anything with it because I, I didn't want to goof it up. Any of us have ever had those thoughts before? It's an honest thought, but it's not the answer. It's not the answer that the master wanted to hear. In fact, his response was pretty harsh. He said, you know what? At least you could, at least you could have put it in the bank, and I'd have at least earned interest on it. He said, but because you didn't do anything with it, I'm taking what you have. So I don't want to concentrate on that. What I want to concentrate on is what the other two did because it's part of the point. What are, what are you doing? What am I doing to increase the skill? Here I am, 62 years old. Do you think I still need to sit down and practice at the piano? No, I don't have to. I am so good, I got it figured out. No, no, I don't have to. Just like you don't have to either. I can just expect God Somebody asked me to come and play something. Well, I don't need to practice it because, you know, God gave me the gift. If he wants me to play it, he'll just zap me and I can play it. It's like, no, if I want to, if I want to increase and if I want to become even more fruitful, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how old I get. I still need to sit down and I need to practice to get better. Apply it in any area. Well, I've been in business for however many years. Do you, can you get better? If you don't think you can... You're done. To the day I die, do you think I can be, when I'm 80, can I be a better husband? Do I have to work at it? No. But if I want my marriage to be fruitful, I have to work at it. Amen? I just have to. I can't take those things that God given and think because he gave it, then it's up to him. Paul ordained, minist uh, ordained Timothy in the ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I think. Um, and he said this, Timothy, make full proof of thy ministry. Everybody say thy ministry. So many times I, I hear people say this and I, I, I get what they mean by it. I, 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 I do get what they mean by, it. well, it's not me, it's the Lord's. Tell that to Paul. Paul told Timothy, he said, you make full proof, in the King James Version says, make full proof of your ministry. He didn't say, make full proof of God's ministry. He said, make full proof of your ministry. So I just look at that and I go, okay. God will deposit something to us, an area that to be fruitful in, an area that maybe we're gifted in. And then I think God looks to us and go, okay, now, I've given you all the stuff. What are you going to do with it? I'll put it in another analogy. We live in an agriculture, we're in an agrarian society here. Farmers do this all the time. Doesn't matter if you're a conventional farmer or if you're an organic farmer. A plant has what's called a genetic potential. So here's corn B. It has a genetic potential to it that the powers that be, that know more about it than I do, says this, this corn plant can produce this amount of corn. So what a farmer does then, farmer looks at its genetic potential, and then a farmer creates a plan that says, what can I do to augment my soil? What can I do to fertilize? What can I do? How can I plant it? How can I cultivate? How can I do whatever it is to be able to produce up to its genetic potential? You see, God has put genetic potential, and it's his genetic potential in every man, woman, boy, or girl. 
all of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit gave gifts. The gifts of God that are in every man, woman, boy, or girl upon the face of the earth are what's found in Romans chapter 12, with what we call foundational giftings. That's why you can have somebody that's an incredible teacher that's godless. They don't know God. They're not Christians. They don't even like God, but they're phenomenal teachers. Where did that gift to teach come from? That's God's stamp. Every man, woman, boy, or girl on the face of the earth has one. There's people that are philanthropists, and they give not because they're motivated by love, not because that God has shared with them. They don't even know God, but they're, but they're, phen- they're philanthropists. They're givers. Where did that come from? God. People that can organize a tornado. Where did they get that gift from? God. I believe this, that only in Christ, only in Christ can we meet the genetic potential that God has for us. It's there that we can meet the full thing, right? The truth is, is there's not a one of us in this room. So, so I grow plant B, right? This corn is supposed to produce, uh, or wheat, I'll, I'll say wheat. This wheat's supposed to produce 125 bushel to the acre. So I get done, I harvest, and I've produced 90. I didn't meet my genetic potential of that plant, so I go into a mode of, hmm, what can I do different to get better? Did I water at the wrong time? Could have I watered it differently? Could have I put more, could have, could have I put more into the soil? Could have I cultivated it at a different time? The idea is, is to reach that genetic potential. I just want to tell you what, this master gardener that we serve called God, he knows your genetic potential and I can tell you, He knows exactly what is necessary for us to continually keep stepping forward in reaching what he's called for us to be and do in life. The cool thing is, and the realistic thing is, it's an ever-ending journey until our next baby step is into glory. All right, and then you won't need to worry about your genetic potential. (laughs) Right? You're You're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So that second point is really, really important. What are you doing to increase your skill level? Third, we, we need to renew our mind. Everybody say renew our mind. The renewal of our mind, Romans chapter 12, the renewal of our mind, we need to get the word of God down on the inside of us to realize, to, to, to change our way of thinking to agree with God. Because how many of you know what he says is what the truth is, right? Versus maybe how our environment produces something within us that, that cuts our legs out from underneath of us, right? Or when we came to Christ, maybe later in life, we had a way of thinking, a way of, of, of processing life that that's just isn't according to the word of God. And how many of you know we need to renew our mind to the word of God? right? And that starts a process. In the Greek, it's called metamorphi, where we get the word metamorphosis, right? Where that caterpillar goes into a cocoon and metamorphoses take place and they come out a butterfly. We got to get into the word and find out what God has to say about us and then involve the Holy Spirit to cause that word to become, if I could say it this way, interpreted. And what I mean by that is how does that become a daily applicable thing for me? Because you may have different hangups than I do. Make no mistake, you have a hangup. So do I. We all do. There's a broken part in all of us. That's just called that, that we, when we, until we give our heart to Jesus Christ and become a new creature in Christ, new creation in Christ Jesus, the thing is, is that you, you get a brand new spirit, but you don't get a brand new mind. And unfortunately, we don't get a brand new body, (laughs) not until heaven. So that mind, we need to renew our mind to the word of God. It becomes the place, the rubric that we use to say, that's what I'm going to believe, right? So we need to get it down on the inside of us that God wants us to be fruitful and live with a can-do. Everybody say can-do. Live with a can-do spirit. Fourth, surround yourself with other winners. Say it another way. Surround yourself with fruitful people. Surround yourself with people who have a can-do spirit about them. 
How many of you know it's, it, it's just cumbersome and it's burdensome? And it, to use a phrase that Robert Mosbach used to use, I, I just love it. He would look at you sometimes and go, you know what? You grow heavy. <laughs> and it's like, it can be heavy to surround yourself with people that are always telling you why you can't do something. Now, on the other side, let me just say this. I'm not talking about what I don't need. I don't need anybody to blow smoke up my dress. Do you know what I mean by that? I don't need somebody around me that just tells me how great I am. Because the truth is, I'm not always great. I don't need somebody around me that just tells me I'm the end all. We don't need people around us that wants to put you in the place of the fourth person of the Godhead. Are you with me? At the same time, I don't want to be around people. So I'm talking about, so, so this one's kind of a sensitive one because I don't want somebody to, to mishear what I'm saying. So when you drop a, 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 a rock in a pool of water, it produces what's called concentric circles. They all have the same deal, but, but they ever widen, right, as, as it goes out. So I'm not talking about these peripheral people. I'm not talking about never get around somebody that's negative because how many of you know they may need you? But I am talking about that inner circle. Those first few concentric circles, those would be your people. Those would be the people in your life that bring you life. Those would be the people that make sure that that group of people, A, are can-do people. And what I mean by that, that their affirmation in you is not that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, you have no issues. But that they're the people in your life that says, within your issues, we serve a huge God and you can do it. Amen. Because we're all going to hit those days that we're convinced that we can't. But surround yourself with people who are fruitful as well. It's always interesting to me how, how over the years people will bring me advice about, you know, whatever. There's times people have watched me discipline one of my children in public or whatever, and they'll come up and go with whatever and, 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 you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that or you ought to do this. And then I'll just turn around and ask him. And so, and how, how are you doing? Well, I'm divorced. Okay. There's a part of me that just wants to go, well, then just shut up. Sorry. But it's like, you know, whatever. Be around other people that are fruitful as well. Sorry. I shouldn't have said shut up. <laughs> Maybe you might just want to be silent. <laughs> no. What I'm saying is, 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 is get people around you that are going to pre- propel us forward, not hold us back. Does that make sense? Is that clear? I'm not talking about a lot of people want to surround themselves with people that are yes people. Problem with that is you will double your strength, but you forget you double your weakness as well. If you surround yourself with people just like you, you double your weakness as well. So the fall, it just means the fall is going to be bigger and harder. The last point, it's a parenthesis. First point was be determined, right? Faithful. The last point is the other parenthesis, never give up. Everybody say never give up. So quitting, other than reference to sin, quitting, other than in reference to things that, are, that need to be taken out of our life. I just believe quitting is not in the vocabulary of a believer. I'm going to quit sinning. I'm going to quit the things in my life that shouldn't be there. But I'm never going to quit going after. Paul says, I press forward for the goal. In other words, you get the idea. When Paul said, I'm going to press, that just tells you there'll be opposition, right? There'll be opposition from your own head. There'll be opposition from the enemy. And there'll be opposition from others right? Let's just have the idea that, you know what? Let's get it down passionately inside of us. God wants me to be fruitful. Amen. He wants me to be fruitful in every area of my life. Now, there's some things that I think we need to ask ourselves a question, and we'll close with these two things. First question, look at yourself. And and when I say this, I'm talking prayerfully before the Lord. What areas are you really fruitful in? How many of you know it's good to remind yourself what's, what good is going on? David did that when he went up against Goliath. Right before he went up against Goliath, you know what David did? He rehearsed his past victories. He said, do you know what? I've slain a bear 
and I've killed a lion. You know what, dude? You're going to be next in line. What did he do? He remembered. He remembered and he looked at and saw, hey, this isn't my first rodeo. Amen? That's important. So ask yourself, what areas are you fruitful in? And then in that, with the Lord, how many of you know there's principles that we can use to help us be fruitful in other areas? It's like, well, I apply this. I, maybe if it's in a skill, well, I, the reason I'm fruitful in this area is I practice an hour a day or I study an hour a day or whatever it may be. Maybe we can apply that same effort into another thing in our lives for us to be skillful in and it can help us be skillful in that as well and we can increase. The second question is to ask then, what areas are you not fruitful in that you should be fruitful in? I'm not talking about expending energy where we shouldn't. Does that make sense? There's some things that's just not my cup of tea. It's not what I'm called to in life. So I'm not going to try to be fruitful in some areas that just aren't me. Right? Fashion design. Wranglers and a button shirt, long sleeve, collar, you're good. I'm, I'm not going to worry about other things. I'm not going to worry about whatever. If that's not my world, I'm not going to try to go into the fashion world and try to be really successful. That is not me. Okay, I know that's an extreme, but I think that maybe if we'll go before the Lord he can just kind of let us know. He can kind of let us sweetly know. You know, he can go. If, if Leah was asking, Lord, I think he can go, yeah, Leah, that's not you. Yeah, don't waste your time. Then I don't have to waste my time. I don't have to waste my energy trying to be fruitful in an area that I'm not. But, but the big things, how many of you know God wants me to have a fruitful marriage? Wants you to have a fruitful marriage. God wants my family life to be fruitful. God wants my calling in life. Maybe you would look at it as a vocation. I don't look at ministry as a vocation, but I understand it has a sort of an idea about that. God wants me to be successful in the ministry. He wants me to be fruitful in ministry, right? Different things in my life. Those, those things that bring me peace and bring me joy outside of work. Those are things that God wants you to be successful in. in. Amen? If there's something that brings joy to you, God wants you to be fruitful in that. I need to get that down on the inside of me and realize that fruit is to be eaten. Not by me. I think that's another area that sometimes as Christians, we think that God wants us to be fruitful so we can partake of the fruit. You can partake of the fruit, but you know what? Fruit, fruit by and large, is produced by a tree so that others can eat of it. And so keep in mind that all the things that define good fruit, that it tastes good. Good fruit, you know, I've never gone out and eat a green peach. Any of you? Yeah, nah, doesn't taste good. Never gone out and eat a, eaten a crab apple early on. I kind of like crab apples later on. There's kind of a side to this sour, bittersweet, I, I don't know, kind of weird, but I kind of like it. It's good to taste. It's sweet, not bitter. And I'm not necessarily sugar sweet. I'm not, I'm not talking about necessarily that, but it's sweet. It's not bitter. It doesn't, it doesn't pucker you. It doesn't pucker your lips. It's pleasant. It produces peace. So then ask yourself the question, when people come in contact with you and eat, eat of the fruit of your life, is it pleasant? Does it taste good? Or is it bitter? I've been around some people, every time you're around them, it's just like walking into a buzzsaw. Who wants to do that? Right? You just want to go, oops, well, okay. Well, cool. Be blessed. Let's say this together. Say, God wants me to be fruitful more than I do. Yeah. Man, let's spend some time just in our own lives. Let's spend some time with the Lord and say, Father, show me where I'm fruitful so I can be encouraged. And then show me areas where I'm not being fruitful that I should be, what I need to do. God will help us. Amen? All right. With that, let's bow our head and close our eyes this morning.
If you're here today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, before we go here, I'd love to give you an opportunity. That's obviously where it all starts. If you don't know Jesus today, there is a stamp of God in your life for sure. We're never going to reach all that God has for us outside of his family. So maybe today you're, you're ready to make that decision to have Jesus be your Lord. If you're watching by screen, I want to encourage you, just stay with us this morning. Pretend that you're in this service because God will meet you right where you are. Maybe you're here today and you, you had a relationship with the Lord that was dynamic, that was vibrant, but now you find yourself, maybe, maybe life's been tough. Maybe there's been hurts. Maybe there's just been apathy. Maybe there's been laziness. Maybe there's been whatever. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But maybe you're at a spot today that just says, I need to get back on track in my relationship with the Lord. I'm going to ask for a show of hands here in just a sec so that we can respond. Not going to call you out. Not going to call anybody forward. We're all going to stand up. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And that prayer will, if you'll pray it from the bottom of your heart, God will meet you where you are. But with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, is there anyone in our service this morning or maybe watching by screen that you would say, I want to become a Christian and surrender my life to Jesus Christ? Or you would say, I want to get back in fellowship with the Lord. Would you just lift your hand anywhere across the sanctuary? I'll just look quickly over here. I see that. I see that there. Thank you. I see that back there. Awesome. Anyone else anywhere? And again, if that's you, yeah, back there, I see it. Cool. If anyone else is maybe watching on screen, if that's you, just stick with us until we're done. I see that there, ma'am. Thank you. I see that over there. Thank you. Cool. Could we all stand up? I want to lead us in a prayer, and this prayer is sort of twofold for me. For those that are responding to becoming a Christian or getting back in fellowship with the Lord, if you pray it from the bottom of your heart, God will meet you right where you are. But then the rest of us that are okay, we're going to be celebrating communion here in a sec. How many of you know it's always a good thing to come to the communion table clean, right? It's good to come to the communion table after Paul said this. He said, let a man examine himself. So that's what the other part of this does, um, is that we can just reaffirm that Jesus is the Lord of our life. Amen. So let's pray this together. Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus and I surrender myself to you. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you for accepting me into your family. And I want to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you, Lord, for meeting me here. In Jesus' name, amen.